The purpose of this video is to provide an updated explanation of the strengths and weaknesses of the MMORPG Guild Wars 2, while also suggesting some ideas for the current player base to discuss on what direction they would like to see the game go in 2021. I'll be covering the good and bad things, because your decision to play a game should include all of the experiences, not just those that fit the agenda of the community, because that would be cherry picking. For those who have played Guild Wars 2 before, but quit and are wondering if it's worth it to come back, if you have the most recent expansion, you don't have to pay anything because Guild Wars 2 is not a subscription fee model. New players will need to buy the game to experience all of the content, but if you did not log in every few months to pick up the Free Living World story episodes when they were the current patch, then you will have to buy them with gold or gems. There is a free to play version of the game that you can try out which is essentially a restricted version without any of the expansion content, but most people consider Guild Wars 2 to be a buy to play game with a free to play trial. There are many new maps and stories to experience, but you may not want to be time or gold or cash gated to experience those. I suggest keeping Guild Wars 2 on your radar even if you aren't interested in playing it at the moment because you can get some content build up for free for later. There is an expansion confirmed for Guild Wars 2 sometime in the later half of 2021, most likely. Not much else is known so I wouldn't get too excited if the only thing that will bring you back is an expansion, but of course, the developers want you to be logging in every day, which is more chances you have of visiting their in-game shop and potentially buying something. Which leads to another important topic. Yes, Guild Wars 2 is buy to play, meaning no sub fee and you gotta buy the most recent expansion, but there is a cash shop. It is not a pay to win cash shop unless you consider skins as the end game and the cash shop has some of the best skins in the game but it doesn't really provide any statistical advantage to buy any of those items there. It's mostly conveniences and skins. It is very actively updated with new items and many players like to collect skins even if they may not use them immediately. There are arguably more skins obtainable through the cash shop than through the actual game, but when you consider that you can convert in-game gold, which can be farmed, into gems, it isn't that bad. What this means is that you can play the game how you want and earn gold to buy gems to get your skins, instead of farming a specific activity to get a specific skin. You just do the thing that gets you the most gold. Or you do what gets you a decent amount of gold while providing you some enjoyment. While this may seem like a great benefit at first, for players who have played the game for a while, there is a lack of distinct rewards to show varying levels of skill or achievement. However, Guild Wars 2 respects your time, because there is no gear treadmill. When you get best in slot or ascended gear, you're going to be relevant forever. So as long as you want those stats, and you don't want to change what kind of build you're playing, you can use that armor set for the rest of your time. And Ascended Gear, like many other things like achievements and masteries, are account bound, meaning that the game is very alt friendly. Once you master one class, you can easily move on to the next with little effort, and use the knowledge you gained without having to start from the beginning. To some people this means there's less content in the game because there's less grind, but to me it just means you have the option to get to the end game faster if you wish. You can still level up manually and get separate gear for each of your characters. So then what is the purpose of playing Guild Wars 2 if there's no gear grind? I know this may come as a shocker to some people, but most just play for fun. The combat system is hands down the best in any MMO and even better than most single player games, and people enjoy just repeating content for the fun of it and to get better at the game. But wait, if Guild Wars 2 is such a good game, why doesn't it perform better on Twitch and YouTube? If you look at MMO populations, you'll see that Guild Wars 2 is still one of the more popular ones, 
but it doesn't feel like it because of its performance on those mediums. This can be a misinterpretation of their statistics, but there are many factors to that. In my opinion, these are the main reasons why Guild Wars 2 doesn't perform well on those platforms. First of all, the targeted audience. Guild Wars 2 has amazingly realistic graphics, but a lot of the time, it feels poorly optimized. While you can run around on the lowest graphics and still be able to play, it feels like you need to compensate more with a better system. Usually kids can't afford amazing PCs, so older people with jobs and better PCs will get more value from Guild Wars 2. Also, the game is very casual friendly because it respects your time and there is no gear grind. This also caters to an older audience of people with responsibilities and less time on their hands. A more casual player base means less representation on these platforms. Also, another issue is marketing. There is no real esports scene. Whatever competition there is, is created by the community. Which is fine because MMO and esports doesn't really work well anyways. What an MMO really needs is an immersive world. And while Guild Wars 2 does absolutely have that, its competition has a big advantage. Look at every other great MMO franchise. You have the Warcraft series with a much more developed world. You have Final Fantasy with many other games and films surrounding it. There's the entire Elder Scrolls series backing ESO. And even Star Wars The Old Republic has roots in one of the greatest film trilogies. Guild Wars does not really have this external marketing from its franchise. It had Guild Wars 1, but that's really drawing from the same audience. And still, Guild Wars 2 performs really well despite not having built up its brand through many mediums. So let's go into some changes that I think will really improve Guild Wars 2 in the upcoming year. First of all, create or go back to the more memorable characters who have been given tough decisions and struggles that concern real issues in the world of Tyria. Traherne was a great character and the questioning of the Silvari's existence as dragon minions and the ensuing racism that we had to overcome was one of the more compelling stories in Guild Wars 2. What about the Shining Blade? Who really is Countess Anise and what is her central plan? And what about the city of Or? We've been there, but we don't really know what it's like when it was the greatest city to ever exist. Maybe the mystery is what makes it so interesting, but then more on these topics should be teased. I don't mean a fractal, I mean a full story. At the moment, our living world feels pretty stagnant. Bram was such a well-designed character during the Heart of Thorns story, but now he's just kind of living on and he's gotten over it. The most meaningful thing, while it can sometimes be a cliche, is death. I'd like to see more people die, to be honest. Let's see some characters be put in situations where they have to make character-defining decisions. Also, let's move away from the player character being the protagonist, because it removes too much of the ability to characterize. Let's put the focus on building other characters, and then allow the player character to make more meaningful decisions, like taking a side, and then seeing actual consequences that differ from the other path, not just the same content with the illusion of choice. Also, let's have a reality check on our player's power. We need to go back to being a nobody. This is such an issue with many ongoing TV shows that deal with RPG or fantasy elements. The main characters have to become powerful to beat the villain, but then a new season starts and the player is still the most powerful being and nothing can stop them. So it just, you don't feel that struggle. So the writers need to create a situation like they get sent to a place where their powers don't exist or they lose their memory of how to be so strong and that allows them to get that struggle again and it makes it interesting story and characterization. Let's see characters that become too powerful or overconfident in Tyria because of their power. Let's see them die. You know, let's see some consequence. We need a balance patch for the characters of the story. And speaking of balance, let's go to the game modes that truly need it. PvP and World vs. World see the most uptakes in population after balance patches. 
whether or not these balance patches actually make the game balanced isn't important because there will always be imbalance because that's just what's fun and creates class identity. You can't have a balanced game where you have nine different classes that all feel distinct. But if you don't like the state of the game because your class isn't the strongest one, then there's nothing to do about that because those people will always be unhappy at one time or another. Yes, the current meta is a little bit tankier than I'd prefer, but there's trade-offs to that because now rotations are more important than kills. You're never going to have a perfect meta. Not so much is balance possible, but just an attempt to shake the game up so it's not the same builds being used and there's more variety because the optimal meta hasn't settled and the amazing build creativity available in the game actually gets exercised. This would not only make the game a little bit more fun and create the real content that PvP games need, but also increase the population. This is another big issue with these game modes. When the population is low, the matchmaking cannot provide competitive or meaningful matches. They just feel like a coin toss because the disparity in skill levels is too high. This isn't really fun or interactive for anyone, and it creates more holes in the integrity of the rating system, which is what motivates a lot of players to keep playing. So it's a sort of snowball effect. The less the amount of people playing, the less people want to play, and you bleed even more population that way. Keeping the balance flowing, even if it's in waves of overpowered and underpowered, is still better than nothing. Another issue that arises in the open world PvP game mode of World vs. World that may be a little bit harder to address is the incentive for playing. A lot of people enjoy zerging, which is large scale fights, and a lot of people enjoy roaming, which is smaller scale fights. Often you will get people grouping up into blobs, and a lot of the game mechanics, combat, and frames start to crumble away when the groups get larger than 30 players. Splitting up should be incentivized a little bit more. The Bloodlust objective on the Borderlands should be worth score and give loot just like every other objective, which would give players more reasons to go there and engage in the very diverse terrain in the Bloodlust area, which can create some engaging fights. Another idea is to make skirmishes, which are like the scoring matches in World vs. World, behave sort of like a battle royale. I don't mean that the map resets every two hours when the skirmish resets, but that certain neutral areas of the map become more valuable during certain times. So on Eternal Battlegrounds, maybe the Hylic camp is more valuable during one skirmish, and then the Ogre camp is in the next two hours. Then the Bloodlust on Red Borderlands can become more valuable during one skirmish, or the Blue Borderland on the next skirmish. This gives more objectives to participate in for smaller groups to allow them to contribute while also getting players to fight over objectives that are more diverse than just involved with sieging a wall and then killing a lord. Obviously, this all needs to be alongside the alliance system, which gives validity to which team you are on and not just a series of bandwagon servers competing over rewards. So transferring will need to be much more strictly regulated. In PvE, we need more challenging small group or solo content. Heart of Thorns felt much more immersive because the maps were full of dangers, not just mobs waiting to be killed. Dungeons could be revamped, but in all honesty, that would be much more work than it would be worth. What we really need is a PvE balance patch that reduces all of the power creep that came in from elite specializations like boon uptimes and damage modifiers, remove permanent quickness and alacrity, or make it require much more investment from a composition to acquire it, that it wouldn't be worth it, and just reduce the sustain and overall damage. This would make self buffing classes that usually get shunned from group content like thieves and necros more acceptable, and would make all of the content in the game less trivial. Nothing feels like a reward if it's just a time gate. Design around the player not being able to progress until they learn a specific mechanic about the encounter or their class, not just getting carried through by brute force. This 
plus some sort of challenging solo content would be great for players who may not have some time to invest in their guild's scheduled activities. I've always suggested a hard mode for map completion, which can give an upgraded version for the Gift of Exploration, which can be used to create new legendaries. The hard mode maps can be tailored to solo content, and the hero points can become mini bosses, while vistas can become jumping puzzles, and heart quests will be more time limits than just a set progress bar, to allow them to be a little bit more engaging and to find out how to optimize it by learning your class's mechanics, and it can be a lot of fun. That's pretty much all I have to say besides that if you're interested enough from this video in getting into Guild Wars 2, you can join my Discord to ask more questions, and if you want to buy the game, just go into the link below in the description. I'll also have a lot of links to other useful resources, and also if you have any comments or suggestions regarding improvements to the game, we can discuss that below as well. Subscribe and like the video if you want more of this kind of content, and I'll see you next time.